Welcome to the November the 29th, 1988 taping of It Happened in Grand Prairie as we bring you history points and bring you up to date on some very special people that have added to the history of Grand Prairie. This is our history tape number 82, number 82. And we are so pleased today to have Dr. and Mrs. Dale Whitcomb, who have been very important in our city for many years. And we're just so pleased to have you all with us today. Thank you. We're delighted to be here. Dale and Joyce, if I may call you that and forget the formalities today, we'd like very much for those that are going to be using our genealogy, our history tapes for future reference, for you to tell us uh, about your lives. And we'd like to begin with Dr. Dale and let him give us the genealogy, the name of his parents, and maybe where they were born or where you were born, and something about the history of the real Dr. Dale Whitcomb back in bygone days as our boys and girls would. And if you'd look out into your camera and do that for us, sir. Yes, um, my father is uh, Manfred A. Whitcomb, and he was born in Webster, uh, Texas and uh, moved at uh, the age of one to a little town in South Texas by the name of Rivera. Uh, something that I recall of interest as far as historical background is concerned is that uh, my grandfather, who was a justice of peace in that uh, part of the country, had a um, document signed by Ma Ferguson. His, uh, the precinct he was in, and uh, the fact that he was a justice of peace for this particular area. And I found that just recently, since my father had passed away, we found this document. I remember my grandfather telling me about Pancho Villa. He used to come across the border once in a while and raid, and uh, since he was a peace officer, uh, they would get men together and go back and reclaim their cattle. He was on one ride where the famous uh, a saying that was made by Captain Armstrong, the Texas Ranger, there was no duty on them paid when they came across boys, and there'd be no duty paid on them when they come back. Mm -hmm. Because the Mexicans tried to tell the Americans, we're going to charge duty as they were bringing the cattle back. Their own cattle. Their own cattle. And uh, old uh, Captain Armstrong just stood up on his horse and his stirrups and told them that there was, this wasn't going to happen. Drive them on, boys. Mm -hmm. And they drove them on. That's the wonderful. Mexican uh, militia just parted and they went back across the Rio Grande River. All right, now we have your father and your grandfather. We'd like for you to add to our genealogy now. Your mother's name, including her maiden name. Lydia Elizabeth Kruska. She was born in uh, a little town in North Dakota. Cancel. Cancel. That's right, Cancel in North Dakota. I'd forgotten it for a moment. And uh, she, um, interesting in, in her history is the fact that uh, Grandfather Kreska wanted to avoid getting into the military. He didn't think the way Kaiser Wilhelm thought. And so he decided that he would take his young wife and they would come to America. And so one daughter was born overseas, but uh, when they got to America, uh, she was uh, pregnant already with my mother, and she was born shortly thereafter in North Dakota. So we have a number of our people that are still in Germany, of course. They came from East Prussia. East Prussia. All right. Now, uh, Mr. Whitcomb and Lydia Elizabeth had only one child. That's right. That was me. And that was... Dale Whitcomb. Right. And where were you born, Dr. Dale? I was born in Indiana. In, in, well, they were certainly traveling around That's from right. North Dakota to Texas. All right. Born in Bremen, Indiana. All right. Give us uh, your magic birth date, if you'd like to, for this genealogy. July 30, 1927. Okay. You're a very young man yet. Isn't that That's wonderful? Right. Great. And as an only child uh, of the Whitcombs, um, did you all travel from Indiana? Uh, what did he do for a living? No, I, uh, uh, when I was five years old, they came to South Texas, mm -hmm. and um, we lived there in this little town of Rivera until I was in high school, and then we went to Corpus Christi. Uh, thereafter, 
uh, came up to the little town over here at Keene, Texas, where mm -hmm. Southwestern Junior College is, which is an Adventist institution, and uh, it has now become a senior college. Then we went to Union College, and that's where Joyce and I met. Oh, in Lincoln, my. Nebraska. Oh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. And we've already gotten you through high school down in Rivera, on down to Corpus Christi, and back up to Keene through a junior college, and then you moved out of the state of Texas. That's right. That's very exciting. Now, we're going to leave you for All just right. a moment. We want to get to Joyce now and keep you all along this little trail together. Joyce, would you look out into your camera and tell us all about the real Joyce Suter? Uh, before she met Mr. Whitcomb? I'd be happy to. All right. uh, my father was John Estes Souter. He was the son of a rancher in Montana, just grew up about 10 miles from the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was Helen Davis, and uh, she was born in Nebraska City, Nebraska. And she and her parents were next door neighbors to the J. Sterling Mortons. Now, Mr. Morton was the founder of Arbor Day. Mm -hmm. And when my mother and her twin sister were born, uh, Mr. Morton went out in his yard and planted two beautiful trees in their honor. And my mother was named Helen Morton, and her twin was named Hazel Arbor. And those trees are still standing today, uh, 78 years since that, since that birth time. Uh, then my, my father was in the Army for four years. Then he came to South Dakota to bring a, uh, some wild horses uh, down to a ranch, which my grandparents had on the Cheyenne River down in the southern Black Hills. And uh, while he was there, he was a dashing, handsome young man of 26. My mother was a young lady of 16, and they met and fell in love. And um, that's where uh, they married in South Dakota, and Dad never went back to, to Montana. Uh, he became a wildlife ranger for the National Park Service. And uh, we lived most, all of my childhood was spent in, the, in those beautiful Black Hills in South oh. Dakota. And Dad was a wildlife ranger there, and one of the early pioneers in bringing buffalo and elk and deer and all of those animals into the large herds that they are today for, the, for public uh, viewing. And he was considered, at least about till up and about 10 years ago, and I'm sure that um, since his retirement, but it, he was considered to be the foremost authority in the United States on the American bison. And young men from all over came to visit. Men from foreign countries came. Uh, the National Geographic Society used to come down to Wind Cave National Park, and, and we entertained them in our home. And uh, they filmed um, Walt Disney's Vanishing Prairie, uh, all the prairie dog scenes. My father was the consultant on that. So from my childhood was sort of a fairy tale and almost a, a, a real privilege, you know, to grow up. So. <laughs> um, just out in nature and, and enjoying it. I had uh, two brothers, an older brother, John, who's a retired forest ranger in the Redwoods in California, and uh, sister Beatrice, who lives in uh, Keene. Her husband is a minister. And uh, a younger brother, Leonard, who's a nurse anesthetist in Redding, California. But we had a marvelous childhood. And uh, uh, during the war, uh, the teachers became very scarce in South Dakota. Okay. And I graduated uh, from a boarding academy, and I had wanted to become a teacher. So that summer I took a uh, little teaching exam at the Black Hill State Teachers College and got a teaching job. At, at what age? At 17, House. in a little country school. How splendid. And I mean, it was country. There was no running water, no plumbing, uh, no electricity. And our only heat was in this pot belly stove in the middle of the room and the outdoor plumbing. And I had uh, children from the first grade through the eighth. And I had an eighth grader who was larger than I was. And he used to come to school early and chop the wood for me. And uh, we had to get water from a stream that went, went by the school. And uh, when the w weather was really bad and there were blizzards, and we had some real doozies. Uh, my father used to come and get me in this great big roaring red fire truck that belonged to the National Park Service because at that time he was 
uh, superintendent of Mount Rushmore National Memorial. That's where we were living at that time. And it was six miles down the mountain and a very curving, winding road to the base of the mountain where my little country school was. And uh, he would come and pick me up then with this fire truck and we would take each of the children home and drop them off at their, at their uh, homes. And most of them belonged to um, miners or loggers. And uh, uh, I was rehired for another year, but I had saved all of my money, my, my enormous salary of $135 a month, and uh, put it in the bank and saved it to go to college. And I went down to Lincoln, Nebraska, and that's where I met Dale. All right, tell us about meeting Dr. Dale then. At that time, he was not Dr. Dale. What, no. what about, about this relationship? Well, he came to the school and uh, he was an upperclassman mm -hmm. and um, very popular president of many things and real active in school activities and editor of the school paper. And um, I was uh, a lower classman, but um, I don't know. We just um, sort of hit it off. And I remember uh, the first time we had a date, it was for a, for a banquet. And uh, this probably sounds corny to the kids today, but you know, this is almost 40 years ago. And uh, we, we went to the banquet, and he was master of ceremonies, so handsome and dashing, and I was in my formal. And we were walking back to the dormitory, uh, the girls' dormitory. Everyone lived in dorms then. Mm -hmm. You didn't um, live out in apartments or anything. Everyone was in a dormitory. And being a lower classman, I had to be in earlier than, than the upper classman did. And so he was taking me back. and and. Uh, we stopped by this little round walk where it divided going off to the different buildings and, and all the young people <clears throat> generally stopped there and that's where you got your good night kiss. So he asked me if he could kiss me good night and I said, oh, of course not, I don't kiss on the first date. So he didn't push it and I was desperate. So I said, well, maybe next time. You know, <laughs> I wanted to make sure that there was a next time. I had no idea whether he would ask me for another date or not. And he said later that that kind of picked his interest that somebody that would <laughs> say, maybe next time. Maybe next time. Right. That, that was a right. good lead line, wasn't uh -huh. it? That was a good lead line. But Dr. Dr. Dale, could we interrupt her and get <laughs> your point of view, not on the, uh, the particular situation that we've just described, but uh, tell us what brought you to the college and bring us along uh, with your part there uh, after you left Keene. Uh, what motivated you to go to Nebraska? The, uh, we only had two years of college at Keene at that time, mm -hmm. and so I had to get my last two years. My grandfather uh, that I had spoken of earlier was also a registered nurse, mm -hmm. and he had worked with the famous Kellogg of Kellogg Foods. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, saw that uh, when he was working with uh, Dr. Kellogg, uh, he saw that uh, the men in particular uh, were very, very reluctant sometimes to ask the nurses for help, especially after prostatic surgery or something of this nature. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of took those people under his wing. And Dr. Kellogg saw this, and so he asked it, uh, asked him one day, he said, would you like to go to medicine? I'll see that uh, you, you can go to med school. And he said, no, I'd rather become a nurse and come back and take care of these patients of yours the way they really need to be taken care of. And that's how he became a nurse. And then he was very influential in my life. Uh, and as a young boy, um, he talked to me a lot about medicine, about nursing, and this type of thing. So when I went to Union, I'd already made up my mind I wanted to go to medicine. And Union had a very good department as far as the sciences, sciences were concerned, and uh, one of the better ones in our denomination. And so that was a reason for going to Union, and then thereafter to Loma Linda University, which is our school out in California. All right, now, knowing full well that you progressed along, tell us, when uh, were you at Union when you popped the question? Yes. And, okay, tell, yes. Us, tell us about the courtship, a little bit about that. Yes, uh, I had decided some months before school was out that this young lady wasn't going to be here if I went out to uh, med school and tried to come back in another year and claim her exactly. or something like that. Exactly. Uh, so I thought this had better happen before I leave or Dale was going to miss out on an opportunity of a lifetime because I knew I loved her and I wanted her as my mate. And so there was a little park that we frequented quite uh, often whenever we had a little time together and it was there that I asked her to be my wife. Yeah. 
proposed, and you said yes. Oh, yes, I said that. He didn't know that I had gone home the year before. We, we went together to, to the two years of college before um, he finished. And I told him, I'd circled the date, May 29th, on the calendar, and I said to my mother, I think I, this will be my wedding day. And, um, and sure enough, it was. And it was. <laughs> it was. It was the day after graduation. He graduated from one. The only objection my parents had was that they had hoped I would finish college before I was married. But um, uh, I, I knew that out at Loma Linda University was a young girl that he'd gone to school with at Keene who was in nursing out there. And um, so even though he thought I might not be around if he came back uh, to Union later, I also wondered if he might uh, find this young girl that he had known before. And uh, so I attended, after we were married and went to Loma Linda, I attended the University of Redlands mm -hmm. in Redlands, California, which is nearby. And uh, I, interesting enough, I had never driven a car. And I didn't tell him that I had never driven a car. And we had a little Plymouth, 49 Plymouth, with uh, no automatic transmission or anything. Stick to it. And yes. And I, I knew absolutely nothing about driving a car. Uh, so I had to drive the six miles to um, Redlands University every day. So I only knew one gear, and I would get it in that and go all the way to six miles. Then I would park on a hill there. The university is kind of hilly. I'd go up and I'd park on a hill with slanted down. And when I got out of class, I'd go get in the car and, you know, pretty much coast those six miles back in whatever gear it happened to, to get in. And so actually, I didn't drive a car uh, with a license to drive and everything until we moved to Grand Prairie in 1959. <laughs> 1959 is the magic year that brought you to Grand That's Prairie. Right. Uh, do you have any children between the time you were in California and 1959? Who's going to bring us up to date on that? Right. Well, we, have all, we had all of our children before we came to Grand Prairie. All right, let's name them. The oldest boy, Craig, was born. Um, that year that I was chug, chug, chugging along in the, mm -hmm. in the Plymouth. Um, mm -hmm. He was born our, first, our year there at Loma Linda. Then um, at that time, there were two years at Loma Linda and then two years at, at LA County and the White Memorial Hospital in Los Angeles. We mm -hmm. called it the city and, and the farm. Mm -hmm. Two years on the farm in, in Loma Linda and two years into the, in, in Los Angeles. And so our next child was born our uh, junior year, which was our first year in Los Angeles. And your next child's name? And his name is Larry. And he was born there. Uh, he's, we have Donald Craig and Larry Dale. And then it seemed like every time we moved anywhere, that's when we had the next baby. Well, we interned, Dale interned. I always say we because I feel like when you've gone through medicine together, it is a team effort, even right. though you're not, <laughs> even though you're not in the classroom with him, it still is a team effort. And so it's it's we. It's always been we. We moved to Portland, Oregon, and that's where Dale uh, did his internship. Mm -hmm. He had a one-year rotating internship there, and that's where. Um, I became pregnant with Karen, and then he was to go into the Army as soon as we got out of there. He, he was to go into, uh, for two years into the military. And uh, we had expected to have Karen um, in, in uh, wherever he was stationed, mm -hmm. but they didn't get around to getting him in until in January um, of that, of 57. And so we were staying with his parents down in South Texas, and that's where Karen was born. So she likes to say she's our only Texan. Only the boys were California boys, and she was born in, in Texas. Wonderful. Now let's get okay. back to Dr. Dale for just a few minutes. Tell us about your military service, and then y'all coming back to Texas in the, in the 50s so that we can bring you here and, and tell everyone in Video Land exactly what you do here in our city now. After I uh, finished uh, med school, as Joyce said, in January of 57, we went into the military. Uh, all of us had to go to San Antonio first for uh, our indoctrination. Uh, Camp Bullis, every physician remembers Camp Bullis because that's where you um, crawl underneath the uh, machine gun fire that's about two feet over your head and they're using live bullets. Um, the, we stayed there about eight weeks for our indoctrination, and then I went to the Presidia of, uh, in San Francisco, and thereafter was assigned to a recruiting main station to take care of uh, men that were coming into the service through the draft and also men that were already in for the state of Idaho and uh, eastern um, part of Oregon. 
What brought you to Grand Prairie, Texas? There was a man by the name of Merle Harris, Dr. Merle Harris, who was a dentist in Kingsville, Texas, which is just 15 miles north of the little town of Rivera where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He knew my family very well, and I remember him as a young man too. But of course, after I went away to school, I really lost uh, contact with Dr. Harris. But through the interim, he had moved up here to Grand Prairie and uh, became acquainted with Dr. Miller, who first started mm -hmm. the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, as uh, Dr. Miller was looking around for someone to come in and practice with him, Dr. Harris and him were talking one day and he said, you know, I don't know much about this young man because I haven't uh, seen him for a while, but I knew his parents real well. And uh, why don't you, I bet he's about ready to come out of the military. Why don't you uh, uh, go and see him and talk to him? And so Merle called my uh, parents, found out where I was at. Dr. Miller flew. And so he and his wife flew up uh, to see Joyce and I in Boise, Idaho. And uh, more we talked and conversed uh, and then finally came to look at Grand Prairie. We decided this is the place we want for our home. Uh, it had um, the small town atmosphere that we were after. Uh, there was no question about the need of a physician and the need of the hospital at the time. And uh, we had a church school here for our children, just everything that we really wanted. And that and church school is the Seventh-day Adventist church and right. school, and that is magnificent, isn't it? That's right. All right, now, Joyce, we've talked about your three children, but we have not talked about their mates nor their children, and we want to get to your books because you're an artist in your own right. So tell us about the children, the grandchildren, then we're going to talk about your books. All right, well, our, our oldest son, Craig, uh, is also a doctor. Uh, he's family practice, and he takes He's wonderful with old people. He really mm -hmm. is good with geriatrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, while he was in his residency, he also graduated from Loma Linda. All of our children graduated, including our son-in-law from uh, Loma Linda University. Mm -hmm. And um, but he took his uh, residency in family practice in Houston at the Texas uh, University of Texas Medical Branch there. Mm -hmm. And while he was there attending church one week, uh, he saw this young lady that. Uh, Who's, actually, we had known her parents years ago, but he didn't know that at the time. But both of them became interested in one another, and uh, after their courtship, he married her. Her name is Jana, Jana Nazario. She was Jana Nazario, mm -hmm. and uh, they married in um, 1979. Okay. And uh, when he finished his residency, he moved up here to go into practice with his father. Mm -hmm. At the Wiscom Hospital. At the Wiscom Hospital, Hospital Clinic. On mm -hmm. What Street? Southwest Third Street, and uh, that's where he's been. Uh, ever since. Do they have any children? And they have two children, a little boy, seven. Name Levi him. Levi Craig. And does he go to the Seventh Day School? He goes to the Seventh Day Adventist School. Now mm -hmm. we have a consolidated school in Arlington. Our school here that we had for so many years has okay. closed down at part of the times mm -hmm. and to a larger school. They have a, a very nice uh, day academy in Arlington. And Levi goes there. He's in the first grade. Mm -hmm. And they have a, a little girl, seven months old, um, Lacey. Lacey Lynette. And oh, well, that is so those are our two grandchildren. Oh, and no. our next son is Larry. He is also a doctor. He's a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And um, he took his fi a five-year residency in San Antonio. And his last year that he was there, uh, one, of his next, one of his neighbors on his street uh, took pity on him because he was there uh, at, at Thanksgiving time, and she invited him over for Thanksgiving dinner. And they uh, had lived as neighbors and didn't really know one another until that, that Thanksgiving dinner. And I said mm -hmm. the way to his heart was through his stomach. Mm -hmm. And uh, she found it. And that, her name is Deborah, Deborah okay. Greeby. She's a Houston girl. She's a, an accountant, a, mm -hmm. a marvelous young lady. And they've been married about three years now. All right. And uh, then Karen, our daughter, probably has the most interesting uh, courtship. Mm -hmm. And uh, Karen, um, couldn't decide between music. She's a very talented musician. Mm -hmm. She couldn't decide between music and some sort of some field of medicine. But she did not want to be a doctor. She didn't want to. She didn't feel that she wanted to spend her entire life doing that. So she couldn't make up her mind. Decided to go uh, one year of college to to London, England. Mm -hmm. And uh, she went over there. And while she was there, she met a young man from Sweden, who comes from a family of physical therapists. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, they they fell in love, but he went home to Sweden and she came back to the to the United States, and he they couldn't um, couldn't see how there was any future for them with him in one country and her in another, 
But he wrote me the sweetest letter, and he told me, he said, now you've had more experience in uh, romance. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't, he says, I just think of Karen all the time. He says, I, I think of her in English, but I dream about her in Swedish. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I would really wonder if we have a future, but I don't know what to do about it. Well, Mother knew what to do. She sent him a ticket to come over and spend the Christmas holidays with us with no strings attached. You know, if mm -hmm. you, after two years, they hadn't seen one another, if you still have any feelings, fine. If you don't, you've just had a nice experience. And uh, so then he came over and spent those three weeks they fell back madly in love, but he had two years of a year of military duty in Sweden to do. He went back, and he Sweden, of course, you know, has a history of being a neutral country. They don't mm -hmm. fight. Um, and uh, he went to his commanding officer after two weeks and said, I'm so in love with this girl in the United States. I would really like to go back there and go to school. And he said, well, where does she live? And he said, she, he said Texas. And he said, well, would you know? He said, my daughter married a Texan. He said, I think you need to go back. And he took, picked up the phone and called Stefan's parents, told him, we're sending your son back to the United States to go to school. And as long as he does that, he doesn't have to do his military. So he came back, and the two of them finished at uh, UTA, mm -hmm. and then both went to Loma Linda University and became physical therapists. And Stefan is now a chief therapist at Harris Hospital in Fort Worth, and Karen is, has her own practice here in Grand Prairie. She has a private uh, physical therapy practice here in Grand Prairie. What an exciting career. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it was. It was a great fun. And I don't know whether it's the writer in me or what, but this, you know, enjoying this vicarious romance with my child was, was real exciting and, enjo and enjoyable. Oh. And, and speaking of careers, before we run out of time, let's show and tell oh. your books. All right. Um, this one is my, the last book that I've done, except for the one I'm sending off this week to the publisher. I have a new book. I've entitled it uh, Singing in the Shadows. It's mainly inspirational poetry, but this one is about uh, poetry about South Dakota, and it was illustrated by my brother John, my older brother John. He's a very talented artist, and he did the illustrations in it, and I'm pleased with it. Mm -hmm. And then this one is my Texas book, and it's called Magic Moments. Magic Moments. Mm -hmm. Are either of these dedicated to anyone uh, in particular? Yes, each of them are. This one uh -huh. is, I, I think, what is it? I believe this one is dedicated to Dale. I wrote this one when we'd been married for 30 years. I was almost 40. We have only one minute to go, right. so tell and us. This the is other. My, my Grand Prairie book. It's called Prairie Poet, and that was dedicated to all of my children. All of your children. Yes. As a, a poetess, as a very special person in Grand Prairie, Texas, both of you into community things, but especially in, into your church mm -hmm. and such wonderful leaders in our community, would like to take this opportunity to thank you for letting us do the interview. We hope that maybe we can have you back later on to give us some more in-depth excitement about the people that have motivated you here in Grand Prairie. Uh, about the different okay. facets of your life, and we want to thank you for being with us well, today. Thank you very much. We enjoyed it. We enjoyed it. And this is Ruthie Jackson reminding you that history is as we live and do.